Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning or good evening, depending on where in the world you are watching us from. I'm Alison Stibby, and I'm from Reuben College, and we are very delighted to be hosting this online event for the Picturing Parkinson's project. Reuben College uh, is Oxford University's newest graduate college. We were founded just last year and we're now awaiting the arrival of our first students who will be coming in autumn 2021. In the meantime, we'll be hosting quite a few events like this, which is a chance to introduce people to Reuben College and also to invite the public into our world where we think we have some brilliant research, fantastic people and engaging ideas. Our aim at the college is to create a really vibrant interdisciplinary community that thrives with entrepreneurial thinking, collaborative working, and intellectual discovery. And this is all aimed at addressing the big challenges of the 21st century. One of those challenges is improving the diagnosis, treatment, and experiences of people with neurological disorders, such as Parkinson's disease. So I'd now like to introduce you to Kristalina Antoniadis. She's one of Reuben College's inaugural fellows, and she's an, the academic lead of the Picturing Parkinson's project. She's an associate professor in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences and heads up the Neurometro Neurometrology Lab and the OxQuip study. So once again, I'd just like to ask if you could please turn off your videos and make sure your microphones are muted for this per first part of, of the event. And towards the end, we'll have a, a wonderful opportunity for questions and answers with some of these people who have joined us here today. So Kristalina, over to you. Thank you, Alison, and thank you ever so much to you and the college for hosting this first online event. Uh, welcome everybody, both here and people who are uh, viewing us live on YouTube. It's fantastic to see as many people as possible and interested and engage into useful and interesting discussions later on. Just a couple of words about the project. Picturing Parkinson's um, was born out of the research trials that we run here in Oxford and particularly from the study I run, which is called OxQuip and is short for Oxford Quantification in Parkinsonism. And essentially this project is all about developing new ways to measure Parkinson's symptoms. For instance, looking at someone's eye movements, gait, cognition, and so on. So picturing Parkinson's is part of the art and neuroscience project that we have within the department with my lovely colleague, Jacqueline Pumphrey here, and Lily, our DIFL student that you will get to speak to uh, a little bit more later on uh, during our, our discussion. And is very much um, about bringing together artists, patients and neurologists, neuroscientists to bridge the gap between the objective research, if you like, into Parkinson's disease and people's lived experience of the condition. What is it to have this condition? Um, I am delighted to introduce the first online event that we've managed to put together for this, uh, for this um, uh, project, uh, Dr. Johnny Ackerson, who actually I came across his uh, fantastic work online and we got speaking. And here we are today doing uh, uh, this brilliant event. And I will introduce you to each of the uh, panelists later on when we finish watching the movie to John Sargent, who is our artist uh, who has been doing fantastic work and workshops and you will see a lot more later on in the year. And also Dr. Kevin McFarthing, who has been a brilliant Oxford participant. And I, I don't even know, Kevin, what, how else to describe you uh, in terms of the fantastic contribution you bring in as a scientist yourself. So without further ado, I would like to um, get started with the video and just show you some of the brilliant work that Johnny and the team have put together um, in, in terms of his story. So Alison, feel free to start the movie. movie. Can you animate to educate? That's the question I'm going to try to answer today. Many thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Johnny Atchison. I'm a husband, a father, I'm an emergency medicine doctor, and I'm an artist in my spare time. I'm also living with Parkinson's, having been diagnosed in 2016 when I was 41 years of age, which is just over 
four and a half years ago now. Did I start to draw? I've always had an interest in drawing and drew a lot as a child. I always had to copy from a picture as I could never use my imagination. But all that changed. I remember watching my neighbour draw and I used to copy what he did. Interestingly, he was a consultant surgeon. When I started the sketch two and a half years ago, it really was quite basic. I used one HB pencil, one rubber, some Faber-Castell India ink pens and a plain A5 sketch pad. So where did it all begin? One night I was taking my daughter to Girls Brigade and we were running slightly late. She wanted to get out of the door and into the car and she said, hurry up dad, hurry up, we need to go. I was sitting at the bottom of the stairs trying to get my shoes on, finish my coffee, grab the keys and put my coat on. She could see that I was getting stressed and was becoming symptomatic. When she saw this she said, oops, oops, there's no hurry, no hurry, we've got time dad, we'll be fine. So in that moment I realised that there was a story to tell and the next day in work at lunchtime I grabbed a napkin that was sitting on my desk and my pen and I roughly sketched out the scene from the night before and you can see it here. And so the drawing began. So I decided I would tell the story of the diagnosis by drawing it. And you can see the finished picture here. I will show you shortly how I managed to get this effect. I decided to simply base the drawings around the letter A, which is the first letter of our surname. Here, I am on the left, my wife is on the right, and the two kids are in the middle, and we are in London. So each picture started to tell a different part of the diagnosis. So in the evenings when I came home from work, and after the kids were in bed, I picked up my pencil and sketch pad and started to continue drawing different scenes. I didn't know what I was going to do with it all. I had thought of putting it in a book for the kids when they were older, but one day I came across this. The World Parkinson's Congress were having their three yearly conference in Kyoto, Japan and they were running a video competition. You could enter if you were a person living with Parkinson's, a healthcare professional, a carer or a researcher. So I thought to myself, why not? So I had drawn all these pictures that told the story, but I didn't have any words to go with it. So I thought to myself, should I tell the story through my 44-year-old eyes? Should I tell it through my wife's eyes, my son's 13-year-old eyes, or through my daughter's 9-year-old eyes? With all the quotes and questions that she come out with, mainly when she put her head on the pillow at night, it had to be through her eyes. 26 drawings later, 26 slides of text, I finished making the short 3-minute 30 second video on eye moving. From start to finish it took about four months but all I had to do now was to set it to the perfect music. Once that was chosen I was ready. To, I was ready. So I uploaded it onto YouTube and submitted it to the WPC. I found out a few months later that it was shortlisted into the top 12 videos. So in June 2019 myself and my wife decided to go to Japan, to the WPC, and although it didn't win, it was played in the main auditorium on the morning of day two of the conference. After the WPC, the most amazing thing happened when people from around the world started to contact me to ask if it could be translated into different languages. That kept me busy for a few months, and I think in the end it was translated into 17 different ones. So what did I draw next? Well, after I got back from Japan, I decided that I would continue the theme of drawing letters and decided that I would draw symptoms by using the words in their name. So this is an example of one of the symptoms. What am I trying to convey here is what stiffness feels like. So I drew the letters, made them into little tin men, put them on the yellow brick road and added a strap line to tie it all together. I think you need, to, I think you need the combination of the letters in the word the background and the strap line for it to work. 
So, how do I get what I'm thinking down on the paper? Well, here's an example. Right, so this is uh, this is how I, I draw. This is how I started uh, way back two and a half years ago. So I've got my, I've got my uh, page, I've got my pencil. And then I would just say I was doing the stiffness picture. I would just draw the outline of the letter. So if I do it here, so it would be something like this. So you just basically draw the, the basic outline of the letter very roughly. Um, you can see it's starting to take shape. And then you just go around. Again, just making your lines nice and nice and straight. After completing the 32 symptom sketches, which took about six months to complete, I realised that they could be used in teaching to help educate, but also to be used to tell my own story. I was sitting in the Leicester Medical School, typing, and there was the faintest flicker in my left little finger. It was slight, but it was there. I also noticed that my typing had become slower. I think in general doctors aren't the best typers anyway, but even by those low standards this was slow, a one finger on both hands type of an effort. I would fall asleep in the evenings before my ten and six year old went to bed. I fell asleep at the noisiest swimming gala you could ever imagine. I even fell asleep at Leicester City Football Club amongst 32,000 fans loudly singing Jamie Vardy's Having a Party. I thought I was just stressed, tired, working too hard, burning the candle at both ends, leaving the hospital at half three in the morning after a busy shift and hoping not to be phoned again that night. I kept tripping. I would scuff my left foot when I was walking as if I'd hit the curb, but when I looked around it was totally flat. I also was developing pain in my right knee after running for 10 or 15 minutes. But the one thing that bothered me was that I couldn't rotate my left wrist quickly. I would look at it and tell my brain, come on, move it faster. But it just couldn't. When I told my wife, she wanted me to go to the GP the next day. But we were supposed to be going to London on holidays. I said I wouldn't get an appointment at the GP's anyway. So we went to London. A combination of tripping and sleeping and tripping and sleeping meant we had to come home a day early. And down to the GP it was. When I was seen in the neurology clinic the next day, I was asked to walk from one end of the clinic to the other. Determined not to scuff my foot, I concentrated hard and managed it without tripping. Maybe it will be okay, I thought when I sat down. You don't swing your left arm much, the doctor said. I hadn't noticed. No one had. Why would you? The neurologist leaned across and said, Johnny, you need a DAT scan. I did pay attention at medical school, but I do not remember anything about what a DAT scan was. My wife, who's an old age psychiatrist, then knew what the diagnosis was as she routinely ordered them in her memory clinics. She simply said, he doesn't know what that is. I'm really sorry to tell you, but you have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, the neurologist said. It was numbing, like someone had pressed the pause button on my life. I really didn't know a lot about Parkinson's. So we went home and sat around the dinner table. 
The kids knew that things were not the way they should be at home, and we decided to tell them what was happening. But how do you tell a six and ten year old? I just said that dad doesn't have enough chemical in a part of his brain that helps him move and be himself. My son wanted to know if I would always be the same, and my daughter wanted to know if the doctors would be able to fix him. Over the past few years, we've always had an open book policy, any question, any time, excluding after half ten at night, when my son usually asks, have you locked up dad? Just checking. If you're going to leave the house unlocked once, make sure that your children aren't the ones to discover it the next morning. Going digital. This seemed to be the most logical next step in my art journey. So last year I bought myself an Apple Pencil and started to sketch using an iPad. This year I teamed up with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine to produce their 2021 charity calendar. I used a combination of sketching the outline of the picture on my A5 sketch pad and then I used an app to transfer it to my iPad to continue to work on it. And this is what a completed sketch looked like. Illustrating the point that assessing children and adults is different but the principles are the same. The 2021 calendar is really about teamwork in what has been an extremely challenging year for emergency medicine. They are satirical, slightly close to the line, but they do tell the story of life in an emergency department. So as I said earlier, when I started drawing two and a half years ago, I started just with doing a, a pencil outline on paper and then going over it with fiber castle ink pens. And that worked really well except when you made a mistake or you wanted to change anything you couldn't. And that was particularly frustrating at the end of a picture. So what I did is I found a solution. So I'll just show you on my phone. So if you go, this is, this is obviously Apple, but if you go to the App Store and if you type in a, um, an app called Carbo, C-A-R-B-O, you will find this Carbo Digital Note. So you just download it, it's free. You open that up, and within that you will see this. And that means that you can take a photograph of the picture. So if I press plus here, you're gonna hit camera here. And obviously then you just take a photograph of that. So, so what I do now is I use an app called Procreate, which you can get in the Apple Store for $9.99. Um, I then go into my photos. I select the photo of the S that I've drawn, uh, that I've taken from Carbo, and then I transfer it into Procreate. And what you can see here is I can add a layer. I can then go over it in black ink digitally. And if I make a mistake, I can um, delete that. And what's useful is you can see when I did the boots, I just pulled the colour in and it happened immediately. I didn't have to um, you know, manually uh, go right round it and, and fill it in. And then you can just go with the dots. Now this is obviously speeded up for the purposes of this talk, uh, but it gives you an idea. And then at the end, once you're happy, you can just uh, remove the layer uh, digitally so there's no rubbing out with a uh, manual rubber. After experimenting with Procreate, I realised there was a lot more functionality with it and the art could go in many different directions, and the main one being that I found colour. So this is Basil, and this is how he was made.
So I was just sitting at my dining room table one morning and I put this badge that I got from Parkinson's UK on the table and I thought to myself, how can I use this to educate about Parkinson's? So basically I just added a foot, added another one, I added a, a hand and then I added another one and then I just made his feet shiny on both sides and hey presto, Basil was born. So I've used them to raise awareness of patients with Parkinson's in hospital getting their medications on time. I've used them to show the importance of exercise in Parkinson's. I think it's also using art and imagery to change culture and to encourage healthcare professionals in the UK to wear the blue brain badge on their lanyards. This is important for a person with Parkinson's. Recently, I had to attend my own emergency department with an unrelated Parkinson's complaint. The nurse looking after me had a blue brain badge on her lanyard, and it was reassuring to see. What Parkinson's medication are you on? When was your last dose? When is your next one? And do you have them with you, she said. The fact that patients with Parkinson's in hospital spent an extra 28,500 nights in hospital in 2019 in England and Wales due to delaying their medications is not good care. Leeds do it well and have made great steps forward but it needs others to follow. It is also using art to encourage others. This short video called Basil Get Some Exercise is to do simply that, to encourage those recently diagnosed or those with mild symptoms to get exercising. But I haven't just kept the colour to Basel. I've drawn various other sketches to raise awareness and to educate, like these two Parkinson's brains, or these two Lego figures trying to show some of the symptoms of this complex condition. They are great, but how do we picture Parkinson's? Maybe like this image from 1886 of a frail, older man with advanced Parkinson's who has a hunched posture and is shaking. Or maybe it's these images from Armstrong and Oaken that I love from the University of Florida. One is of a younger woman who is running with signs of mild Parkinson's. One of a middle-aged man depicting motor fluctuations. And the final one is an updated image of the 1886 one again, depicting a frail older man now using a walking aid. Or maybe you see this. An image that I recently sketched, which is modern, gender neutral and race neutral. An image that is ageless, one that truly pictures Parkinson's disease, 
one that widely educates, and most importantly, when a person with Parkinson's looks at it, they can see some of themselves in it. It's not just Parkinson's and emergency medicine that I sketch. Recently, I've started to draw animals. I use the words in the name to draw the shape, as you can see here. I've also started drawing people's pets, again using the letters of the pet's name to create the shape. This is Ruby and Steve. This is one of my favourites. I've also put my art online at www.johnnyatchesonart.com where there are four galleries. So I would just like to thank you very much for coming and listening today. And if you want to uh, watch the full uh, WPC video, that is provided in the link uh, in the talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask the panel to switch on their cameras and their mics, please? What everybody, brilliant, thank you. Um, hello everybody, joining us both on Zoom and on, on YouTube. Uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here today and I hope everybody enjoyed the little film that we've put together with the brilliant story and the work uh, from uh, Dr. Johnny Ackerson. So Johnny is here, if you want to give a wave so everybody can see you Johnny and um, he'll be taking any questions you like. Let me introduce you to the rest of the panel. I have John Sargent, if you want to give a, a wave John. Uh, who is our artist as well. Mm -hmm. I've got Dr. Kevin McFarthing, um, who is, uh, an, uh, who's got a, human, a tremendous experience in, in industry. He's a scientist himself, writes the hopeless and an endless amount of things that uh, he's been helping us with. Jacqueline Pumphrey, um, a co-PI on the project. We've worked closely for years and, and it's fantastic to be able to, to do this online now. And also the communications and public engagement manager for my department, the Natural Department of Clinical Neurosciences here at the University of course. And of course, last but not least, our wonderful DFL student, uh, Lily Zisu, who is joining us from Canada today. So I'd like to open the floor to any questions that we might have. And I know that Alison and Jacqueline um, are looking both at Zoom and on YouTube. I wonder if anybody has any questions at the moment or whether we should start from the panel. Okay, shall we start from the panel then? Um, any any questions to Johnny to to kick this off? Yeah, I've got a question for Johnny. Um, do you find it therapeutic? Um, yeah, I do, I do find it therapeutic. I, I find that um, I think certainly at, at the start, um, drawing the diagnosis was, was very therapeutic. Um, and then moving on the syndrome sketches, I, I find those those are quite detailed. So. Um, th those those sketches probably took me took me the, the longest to do, um, but it, it was good because it, it it really focused the brain. Uh, you know, if you were able to sit down and get the idea. Once you got the idea, then you, you were able to to uh, put the background in and put the detail in. So one of those syndrome sketches probably took about probably took about an hour and a half and, and told and told to do. Um, now the, the animals and the, and, and the pets that they, they take a bit they're, they're not they're not as not as long to do but I think um, I'm enjoying those I'm enjoying those as well uh, so yeah it, 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 it is very therapeutic and and if I can continue from that question Johnny so do you do you always find that you start and finish your your work of art I mean I've asked this with John as well and the other artists we work with you know do you do you need time to perfect what you had in your mind, if that is a word in art, I guess, uh, or do you find that you've got the essence, um, you know, when you start drawing and then it's almost like the finishing touches? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly for the, for the symptom sketches, it took a while to work out how, what you were going to draw. So you might've put a few ideas down in paper and that didn't really work. And then 
and then all of a sudden it would come to you and then once you once you had the idea and you had the strap line then it just it just flowed it it just you just started it and, and basically finished it and, and pretty much pretty much one go um same same with the pets actually and um, putting the names into the pets again it um it depends some of them you can do very very easily um some pets names fit very well others don't so you have to work around with them uh, so it's a bit of, a bit of give and take really mm -hmm. yeah and i wonder if i could bring in john here and tell us a little bit because we have different ways of of or different types of art here is that similar to you know what you would say in terms of, of your art and i'm just wondering you know it's a nice um, interactive chat really between artists here and also jacqueline as well if i put you on the spot here no my experience I'm on Zoom call. Oh, sorry. Some, I've just seen Janet's name come through. Uh, go ahead, John. Yes, I'll, I'll yep. get Janet in a moment. Yes, okay. go ahead. Thank All you. Right. Uh, no, my, my experience is very different. I and, and I don't actually even have an idea when I go to a canvas as to what I'm actually going to produce. Mm -hmm. I just know that I'm in the mood to actually paint and a lot of my work that I do is very loosely based around um, giving expression to how I feel at any given time about having Parkinson's. Um, so I never really quite know what's going to come out on the canvas. Um, I, I start painting, I'm very um, absorbed in the painting while I'm doing it and then I'll look I look at what what I've done and decide, yeah, that's okay, that's finished. But um, I don't perfect things like Johnny um, in in that sense, and I don't go into it with that feeling of this is what I want to show at this point. It's almost like I go into my, what I'm thinking comes through in in a sense through the paint, and and that's something that I'm very very keen to develop with other people, particularly people who, who have a Parkinson's themselves, or their carers, because I think the carers, in a sense, they, they experience Parkinson's very, very, um, it's very, very much part of their life as well. And they can have the frustrations and the grief and the loss of dreams that, you know, we with Parkinson's, we, we do experience that. They experience it kind of quite vicariously, but it, 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 they need a vehicle for expression as well. And I find for me, Kevin asked earlier, is it therapeutic? I only started painting in 2018. I'd had to give up my work at the university. Uh, <laughs> I'm a literature specialist. Uh, I wrote poetry. I never painted. Um, but I read that it was very good for Parkinson's people to paint. And it has been. And one question I wanted to ask Johnny actually was, Johnny, do you feel that by being able to express your feelings through your artwork about Parkinson's, that it's actually helped you come to terms with it? Um, and, and if you like, move forwards, accept and move forwards. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it's been a very good way of just getting how I was feeling out, um, you know, how it affected everybody in the family um, and how people have, have adapted, you know, was adapting every day really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, um, it, it's been very, it's, it's been very helpful um, in, the, in that sense. I, I, I don't know how, how I would have managed you know, without without it, if you know what I mean, it's been a real, it's been a real, um, it's been really part of the, it's nearly like part part of the treatment in a sense. Um, just being able to, you know, um, to, to 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 draw and the chan to channel that in into into that. Um, mm -hmm. I find it I find it very 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 helpful. Um, although I think over time it's changed. So, uh, the detail of those symptom sketches, I. I if I had to do that now, I'm not sure whether I would be able to do it as, as well. Um, whereas moving into the sort of the, 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 the pet ones, 
and that they're they're easier they're easier to draw. There's not as much detail, although mm. um, obviously the lines need to be need to be quite quite straight. So I find I find using an iPad actually. You can nearly, you can nearly, when whenever you rest your your hand on the iPad and you've got your pencil, it nearly, it nearly stick, not sticks to it, but you can pull it down very slowly, uh, in a control, in a controlled way, uh, much more, uh, much more control, I think, than um, than a, than a pencil or a fiber castle ink pen. Now my uh, my sims are, are mainly on my left side, uh, coming in my right side. But, but I'm right-handed, so it hasn't affected, in a sense, um, the drawing at cert certain parts parts of the day. So, um, yeah. Uh, can I can I just say that I don't draw at all. You, you don't draw. Yeah. I don't. I don't sketch. I don't draw. I don't do preliminary work. I don't yeah. work from photographs. Yeah. Um, I actually find manipulating a brush sometimes very very difficult. So um, I use screwed up kitchen roll and sponges yeah, and yeah. sticks and things like that to, yeah. to make marks yeah. um, because I think sometimes people are put off art by thinking that they have to be able to draw. Yeah. Yeah. And in actual fact, there are so many different forms that yeah. you, you know, yours is, is one form and, and I work on canvas, so it's one of mine in the background there. Um, there's room for everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'll change as time moves on. You know, I'm not going to be able to do what what I can do at the minute, you know, forever. And um I think um, you know, it, it's again adapting, isn't it? And accepting and you know, the art will change as time moves on. But you know, I'm just thinking in my head, you know, what 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 do we do with a blank canvas, a load of paint, some twigs and tissue paper, you know? It was a, <laughs> it would be maybe we should maybe we should that. Uh, Maybe we should have a chat about that afterwards to see see that what the, what what, what we could come up with. But yeah, I mean that's it. It's all about it's all about adapting, changing, accepting, and and, and making the most of what you've got really. Um, uh, to to live as well as you can every day, and that that's what it's about. That's what it's about. So it's about living as well as you can every day with everybody around you, with Parkinson's, and that's the, that's that is the bottom line. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both, Johnny and, and Jan. And I, I really like this, this crosstalk here because this is very much what we set out to do. And this online series, I think, is proving that there is a lot of um, interest in terms um, uh, of, um, of bringing different artists together, but also artists who are people with Parkinson's and you experience the symptoms. And it's exactly, you know, listening to both of you is very interesting because I never thought to ask the question to you, Johnny, what you've said about using technology which, you know, as part of our bigger trial technologies, it's, uh, and with Kevin, for instance, we know that this is the way of forward, especially if you're doing telemedicine and home monitoring. And then technology, again, seems to be finding its its place within what you're doing. And, and I do wonder if you've got any advice for people who might be experimenting, you know, um, even people who will be watching this later on on our, um, you know, on, the, on YouTube, how to go about it. Because, you know, we do get emails saying, where do you start when, when you don't know from where to start? And there's so much availability out there if you don't want to use the typical, um, the traditional ways, if you like, of drawing, what John does, what, um, what you did as well with your sketching or using a pencil and so on. I mean, it's really, I mean, I would encourage anybody to, to, to um, you know, to, to give it a go. It, it doesn't. It doesn't matter what it looks like in the end. It's it's the process of doing it. I think that's important. Um, it's a it's a concentration. It's focusing the mind. It's it's really um, looking at what you've created at the end. That that that, that that's important. Um, the good thing about digital art is that it's not messy, so you don't have to clean that thing up, uh, and you, you don't actually need you don't actually need. Uh, you don't need a studio such so you can do it sitting on your kitchen table or your dining room table. So um, you can paint there as well. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Exactly, exactly. So um yeah, digital the, the, the iPad's been good for me. Um it's very good, as I said in the video. If you make a mistake, it's very easy to just erase it um and then go over it again. So for people that um you know are starting out, um I mean, when I when I drew as a child, I used to I used to copy things, and, and try it that way. But I mean, an iPad Procreate's very easy. It's very easy to learn. You know, it's ten pounds. Obviously, you need the iPad and the pencil. But um, 
you know, you can create you can create loads of shapes. My daughter grabs it sometimes and she creates loads of sort of colourful circles and squares and triangles and it all looks very aesthetically pleasing at the, at the end. But there's so much you can do with it. You can use brushes, you can use watercolour, you can use, um, you know, um, there's, there's, there's lots of different, um, lots of different um, uh um, mediums that, that you can use on, on the app and uh, I mean I've just stuck with a technical pencil I haven't gone gone any further than that but if it, if it did uh, change then you know it would certainly be probably doing a bit of both and see what which one I, I like the best whether it was digital or, or just traditional. Certainly I, I see a, an Akison uh, family project coming along I think with your little girl as well <laughs> as part of this definitely. Um, I think I've got a question from Lily. Would you like to go ahead? Yes. Um, so should I start with the um, YouTube and the questions from the chat? Or can I? Where can? Okay, so Janet has um, a question. Um, Johnny, it was great to see that your film was translated around the world. Do you know if it has encouraged other people to draw aspects of their experience. And to follow that, um, I have a question of my own to both, both artists. Um, I think after this talk, many people are gonna start trying to draw now. Um, and what is the greatest challenge you've had um, when you first started drawing and expressing yourself? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first question there, um, thanks. Um, so thanks, thanks, Janet, for asking that. I think um, I think I'd, the the answer is I've, I have absolutely no idea how many people I, I have uh, have taken up drawing uh, as a result of, of seeing my, my pictures. I know there's a couple of guys in America who have said you know that they they've taken up sketching just as a hobby because of the stuff we put out in Twitter. Um, so I I don't know the answer. I just know that there's a lot of people with Parkinson's who who do draw. Um, and there's an exhibition in London now. Hopefully, um, it's in the Oxo Tower on the uh, I think it's the 9th to the 21st of February, uh, which uh, Tr Trevor Willard has has organised. Uh, uh, he's living with Parkinson's, and that's basically bringing artists together around the world who, who draw. And it's 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 a big it's a big thing. And uh, we're just hoping with COVID that people will be able to get there face to face, mm -hmm. but. If not, or if there's restrictions, there will be, um, there will be um, a, a, hopefully a digital virtual uh, event that people can come and look at, see what it'll be a whole range of a whole range of, of, of different mediums and, and different artworks and different interpretations. So um, that, that, that's probably a, a good event to, to go to, to, to look to see the range of the range of art that the people with Parkinson's around the world are able to do. Lily, yeah. What was the next question, Lily? Sorry, the next question was for uh, both Jan and Johnny. Uh, what, what was the greatest challenge um, that you had to get you started on this creative um, journey? It's a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think I think I think it's probably having something to draw. I mean, for me, it was having something to draw about, if you know what I mean. So, and, but that's changed over over time. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it was. Um, I think, I think, I think if I hadn't been diagnosed with Parkinson's, I, I, I don't think I would have picked up a, a pencil. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Which is which is strange. I was thinking about, you know, why why I picked up. I just found I found it a medium to 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 relax in in in, in the evening, so, and it's just it's just really gone from there. So, um, the challenge the challenge sometimes is more of putting the pencil down than than uh, than um, not picking it up, if you know what I mean. Because you can get absorbed, and sometimes it uh, it uh, you, you're drawn for a bit longer than than you actually realise. Thank you, Johnny. What, what about you, John? Uh, oh, I, I, I suppose that one of the things I want to say there is, um, it, to me, Lily, it's not about drawing. 
as an artist, art is about a lot more than, than drawing. And I, I don't want anybody watching this to go away thinking you have to be able to draw to express how you feel through paint. Um, but for me, the greatest challenge when I started was that lack of confidence in mark making. And I had no experience of paint. Mm -hmm. I, I, I only took it up because I didn't want to watch daytime TV. I've had to give up my work at the university. I didn't want daytime TV. And in January, it was too cold to garden. So I picked up a brush simply to stave off boredom and found that it was absolutely absorbing, therapeutic. And my challenge then became, how can I, how can I develop my work as an artist? and be seen as an artist who happens to have Parkinson's, not a person with Parkinson's who paints. Mm -hmm. right. and that's an interesting distinction because part of the way I see my work is to, I, Johnny used the word educate. I think it is about trying to help draw others out, draw out of others how they feel and give them the confidence that I lacked when I first started so that they themselves can have a go. And I mean, Crystalina, you'll know when I've worked with, with, part, with people with Parkinson's down in Oxford, I talk about playing with paint. To me, that's the challenge. It's getting over that mindset. And that's why I challenge the word drawing because people have this thing about, I didn't do art at school. I don't draw can't draw therefore I can't paint and I can't express myself mm -hmm. and that's not right and it's getting people to overcome that self-resistance if you like mm -hmm. that I think is really important about this project. Yeah and I guess what I hear from both of you here and having worked uh, you know with both of you and especially you know with this latest creation uh, with Johnny's work is very much about giving the confidence to people, especially with Parkinson's, that we know it could be one of the early symptoms that manifests in ways that doesn't necessarily tell you is a neurological disorder um, like Parkinson's. And I guess is is um, something coming from both of you that are not artists per se. They didn't study art. They didn't follow the traditional path, if you like, of, of you know being educated in in art and design and so on. And sharing your stories and what you, Johnny, are doing today and what you've been doing with us, John, is is amazing because it's showing to people that there are various ways into these that could potentially help people express themselves and express what you're going through and also help uh, people like you both said, carers and families uh, understand what what are the difficulties of, um, of going through this. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Lily, can I just ask a couple of things? There's so many questions on Zoom. Could yeah. I just ask a couple of the questions? Because uh, uh, there's a lot of questions for you, Johnny, and do, do say if it's, <laughs> if it's getting too much. So there's a question from Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, Johnny, several questions. Um, what do you have planned with your artwork next? What is the next project? Where would you like to take it next? Okay, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. So the, the 32 symptom sketches, which is called Parkinson's Portray, that, that's basically what we're trying to do is get that into 10 trusts and 10 medical schools in 2021. So it's been in Leicester hospitals, Leicester Medical School. It's, it's, it's in the East Surrey hospitals at the minute. It's, go, it's going to Derby and hopefully in, in, in March next year. It doesn't have to go at each, wait for each hospital. The prints are there. If a hospital wants them, then they just contact me and I will send them to you for free. And then you can put them up to educate and raise awareness about Parkinson's. So that's ongoing. Um, then I've started to, um, the, the next sort of step is to sort of um, to animate. So I've been playing a, around, a bit around, for a 2D animation using an app called Flip a Clip, which is just basically getting Basil to move. So uh, that's been quite interesting. I got him to do the hooky cookie last week. So uh, that uh, that is uh, that's a work oh, that's a work in progress. So again, you know who, who knows? Um, I'm just I'm just um, I'm just thankful that I'm, that, that, that I'm, I'm able to, to do it and, and express and express express myself through it. So yeah. Um, 
I'll continue to draw the uh, the animals, the the pets, and um, and we'll see 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 what happens. See what happens. The biggest thing is probably um, the WPC in Barcelona in 2022. They they they'll have another video competition. So I'm uh, sort of racking my brain at the minute trying to decide what uh, what I might do if if anything. So we'll mm -hmm. see. Brilliant. Thank you, Johnny. And I, I have to say, I had a sneak preview, if you allow me saying that, Johnny, into, into Basil and, you know, the little anime. And it's brilliant. I'm sure it's going to be a, a great, a great hit. So that answers the next question from um, from this uh, person. Have you considered expanding more into animation? And I guess that that's sort of your plan, getting getting your, your Basil and all your figures a little bit more animated. The next question, Johnny, is has your personal exploration of your hobby overflowed into or altered uh, the way you approach medicine? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's uh, altered the way I approach, approach medicine at all. Um, you know, medicine, you're very much trained to, you know, see patients in a certain way. And that hasn't, that has, that hasn't changed through the art. If I meet a patient who is artistic now, I might be a bit more delayed getting on the next patient because we have a good chat uh, yeah. about what they do and, and their art and stuff. So um, I, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's affected the way I practice. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's just because emergency medicine is is very it's very um, there's a certain way of of, of, of practicing. It's very focused. So uh, it um, I ha that hasn't changed. Absolutely. And I guess we relate a lot because if I find someone who is interested in the art and neuroscience, it will take double the amount of, of the clinic time. Really. Uh, but again, absolutely, I agree. And the last question from the same person is what aspect of it all was the most surprising, not expected at the start? Sorry, what was that? What was the? Uh, what aspect of it all was the most surprising one? Um. I think probably, um, I think probably at the start, you know, just drawing that, making that movie uh, about through my daughter's eyes, you know, I didn't expect it to, you know, to, I mean, I to get to get to Japan and see it, you know, um, was was quite 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 amazing, really. So that 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 sort of started was the start, and it really it really just encouraged me after that. So I think that probably was the was the one thing I still I still watch that film and it, it floods it, it floods a lot of memories and you know it's it's there it's captured and it's uh, it, it's there to watch so and as we know the world Parkinson's Congress is a very competitive place to get some of this work you know there's a lot of of um of people entering their work so um I, I suppose it's a you know it's, it's just a huge achievement to be able to be even part or shortlisted in in, in yeah. a fantastic congress like that I've got another question from Larry here. Um, how has art helped you explain to others what you're going through? Well, um, so our arts, arts, um, it's it's a great way. It's a great way to express. So, be, I think, you know, certainly on, on on social media and stuff, you know, if if you put out a picture of stiffness like that, with, you know, tr trying to explain what what it, what it feels like, is 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 useful. You know, I think I think certainly. The, the art around the non-motor stuff, so the invisible symptoms. So I think that's the key. The motor stuff people can see. So the non-motor stuff they can't see and they, they can't see how debilitating and disabling it can be at times. So, you know, apathy, um, you know, anxiety, mood changes, um, you know, multitasking, um, concentration, memory, mild cognitive issues, you know, all, all that. The art's been very useful to to explain to people what it feels like. Now I know it feels different for other people, but I think that that's been helpful. And then the, the Parkinson's person that, that I drew, that that I think helps to for people to realize that it's not just a tremor, you know, that it is multiple systems, it is a complex condition. Everybody is different, but it, it helps to it helps people to start to understand that it's it's not the way it was taught in medical school mm -hmm. absolutely and i've got a, a more general question here uh for for all of us i guess is art recognized as therapy 
in the clinical context as a prescribed treatment and does this get funded within the NHS? What an interesting question and where do we start and where do we stop here? Um, Johnny, shall I let you start on this? Um, I, I'm not sure. I know exercise is funded at times. So exercise, you know, I think there's been exercise programs funded in primary care. Um, I'm not aware of any art being funded uh, in the community, but I, it, it, I don't see why, why it shouldn't be. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, um, it's helpful. It, um, it, it, it helps people with Parkinson's and it would help people access it who, who otherwise mightn't be able to. Uh, so um, maybe, 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 with, maybe pharmacists around the UK, when people with Parkinson's pick up their medication, should give them a, few, give them a paintbrush and, and, a, and, a, and a sketch pad. That might get them started. We're going to have to talk to the NHS, uh, Johnny. Yeah, it's an offline discussion to have. But uh, if I could go next on this one, um, I guess the straight answer to this is no, because art is not considered art as traditional um, uh, sort of treatment, if you like. It's not a drug, it's not a medication, it's, it doesn't have a drug regime um, and so on. But I guess the, the question is, how can you approach this and convince you know, a huge organisation like the NHS or the, the 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 the, um, the sort of positives that you see from having people doing art, and I'm not just referring to the art that picturing Parkinson's and the art that the colleagues Johnny and Jana are talking about today, but things like what Johnny says, exercise, speech physiotherapy, you know, ballet for Parkinson's, which I'll ask Kevin in a moment to tell us a bit more about through the Oxford Parkinson's branch, and it's um. It's, it's sad for me to see that we haven't had more um, uh, sort of people fighting for the art side of things, but to defend the NHS, there's so much pressure, especially with all the, all the problems that are going on with the pandemic at the moment, that I can see how this could be difficult. In the larger scheme of things though, especially looking at public health, this will be tremendous. And I must say, I've, I've had um, incredible talks with uh, both um, the panel here uh, in, in the Oxford University Hospital, but also with Public Health England, being interested about the type of work we do, especially combining things like the art that we see within picturing Parkinson's, but also exercise. And exercise, not only in the form of physiotherapy, you know, different forms of exercise, but dance. And the fact that there is a ballet for Parkinson's dance, you know, that I know that um, the folks here in, in Oxford are doing. And we have we have tremendous feedback. We, we don't run it. It's, it's colleagues of ours who run it. But the, the amount of feedback that the patients say, you know, they couldn't they couldn't walk and they go in and they're able to do ballet and they come out an hour later feeling you know elated that they were able to do the movements that otherwise they wouldn't i think that in itself um gives us enough evidence at the moment that we should look a little bit more into this because it's not only about the traditional treatments if you like and i use that very carefully uh for for parkinson's disease kevin do you have anything to add from what you do in the branch as well uh, let me just unmute you. Would you like to? Um, yes, there you go. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the thing about doing activities like, like art, like ballet, is they absorb you. It's not just following a, si a simple series of exercises, um, which st still can be enjoyable, but the extra activity allows to, you to put more of yourself into that activity and get more out of it as a result. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. So, so you're curious, the other thing to add, and this is, this is something that um, Johnny and Jan will do in their art, it's expressing emotion. Mm -hmm. um, a, lot, a lot of description of symptoms, for example, is just that it's descriptive. It's a bit cold, it's a bit sterile. If you draw the symptoms, you can bring emotion to it and feeling. Absolutely, Kevin. Sorry, I missed the first part. There was a cut in my in my Wi-Fi, I think, here. Yeah, I entirely agree with you. And it's bringing in the emotions that all of you are trying to explain to us of what you're going through over and above the typical motoric and even non-motoric um, aspects of Parkinson's, that there's a huge range there that we, we haven't even touched a lot of them. And speaking with all of you and interacting, you know, on, on, a, on a friend's basis, as opposed to seeing you within our clinics, it's been incredibly useful to all of us. And I guess, Lily, the same for you, seeing, seeing 
or people with Parkinson's within your PhD as well, because we learn a lot that we haven't considered beforehand. Yes, that's for sure. I So coming into my PhD, I Parkinson's to me was all the knowledge on textbook and what the cells look like, what the imaging um, looks like. But it's only when I had the chance to um, interact with patients and um, getting to know about their life and how their lives has been impacted um, by Parkinson's that's given me um, many different angles of looking at um, Parkinson's and that's definitely um, shown me more how I should be conducting my research um, and also many new ideas of um, things that we can do to let the wider public um, know more that Parkinson's not just the tremor and also other things and activities that can bring patients together um, for them to be able to express themselves. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Lillian. It's been incredible to see students like Lily grow through their training here with us learn about Parkinson's and being inspired by, by all of you, the work you do and the support that you give back to us and, and our work within the, the research frame. Um, I know we're running very close to time and we're a couple of minutes over. Just a couple of more questions and then I'll ask comments for everybody from the panel. Um, and then um, I guess if anybody has questions, feel free to email us directly. A comment from Gina Swartz uh, that she's been trying for many years to introduce the concept of dance and movement therapy into an acceptable framework for treating many neurodegenerative conditions in the NHS and beyond. And she's suggesting, and it's something that Gina and I have been discussing about, uh, we can uh, address this via the Academy of Medical Sciences that uh, Gina is now part of. And I guess it's a great idea that we should be uh, talking again offline how we can do that. And, and I'm happy to put this forward and, and bring everybody together. Thank you, Gina, for that comment. Um, and I guess um, the last question from Megan, uh, thank you so much, Johnny. I was just wondering if you believe your symptoms have affected your representations of movement in artwork at all. Example, if your gait has altered, if then you went to draw someone walking, would you alter motor abilities influencing the way you depict walking? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever... Because I've, I've drawn, from a Parkinson's point of view, the only thing I've ever drawn in sense is is, um, is the symptoms. I've, when I was first diagnosed in that story, those eyes, there was, there was, you know, there was, there was shaking and, and stiffness and tremor and that sort of thing. But um, I think I think everybody tells, you know, if, if you're educated about Parkinson's, it's where you're at. So so you can only really talk about what you're experiencing at the time so so and that's that's what i do so over time i think you know as things change then you know the way i educate about it will change and the art may well change uh, as well so um i think um i think it will um as as things as things change yeah thank you Kevin, can I bring you into the discussion here? You've got tremendous experience looking at um, clinical trials, looking at the science. Um, you are a research participant yourself. You're, you're also on our on our committee for, for Oxquib and a lot of other studies. Can you just perhaps summarize to us what you've seen changing over the last few years, even the last two, three years in terms of what's happening in research and how you see this sort of work we do within picturing Parkinson's, perhaps helping a little bit more, not only our study, but you know, collaborative studies and, and colleagues around the world in, in improving and getting quicker to that very uh, wanted treatment, um, hopefully in the near future. I think one um, very interesting um, thing that's happening in, in the world of Parkinson's research and development is the amount of money that's being invested and we, we saw this week um, Lily spending a billion dollars to acquire a relatively small company in, in, in the US called Prevail. Um, and there are approximately 350 clinical trials, sorry, projects, 250 projects in research and clinical phases trying to find new therapies for Parkinson's to release symptoms, 
uh, and to look at trying to modify the course of the disease. But one of the things that still inhibits us is how do we measure the progression of symptoms in a obje- clear and objective way? Um, and I think the more we can express how those symptoms affect us, not just objectively, but also subjectively, um, there's a, a, a thought that a lot of what's measured is what clinicians can observe. I think we need to, to, to try to, to move more towards patient reported outcomes and to try to understand how patients feel as well as describing their symptoms. So if we can get the, the junction of those themes together, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be making some real progress. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that, Kevin. That's that's a very, very nice summary. Bit. And how would you think we could get patients more involved? What what are we not doing that we should be doing? Or what should we be doing more, really, um, uh, from, from our sort of clinical aspect or research aspect? Um, it's a good question because... The researchers like yourself are absolutely very firm advocates for patient involvement in in research. Um, And it's also some of the work that um, Larry and the PD Avengers are trying to do as well, is get the patient voice heard so much more, Um, not just in in research, but in how Parkinson's is funded, how it's treated. um, uh, And I I think we we almost need a, a revolution in patient involvement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and perhaps something we, we ought to start thinking and planning and acting more, I guess, from what you're saying, that we need to get more people uh, and this revolution really coming sooner yeah. than later so we can get to that stage. Yeah. Can I just yeah. come in? Oh, sorry. Could I just say, um, in relation to what Kevin was saying, my, my neurologist in Leeds was wonderful in the sense that he would actually encourage me to take along some of my paintings to explore the way that I felt about where I was developing with my symptoms and how I felt about things. So, and I think that's, that, was, that was very empowering for a, neuro, for a neurologist to do that. That's fantastic to hear, John. That's brilliant. Uh, and something we all of us, yeah, to keep, to keep in mind. Thank you for sharing that. Right, I'm aware we're, we're running late with our time here and thank you everybody for, for sticking out the, this long. Johnny, I'll ask you to have the final word before I draw uh, close to, to this meeting, please. Well, I just, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I uh, hope you've uh, taken something out of, out of today. Uh, you've learned something about Parkinson's and um, yeah, uh, wherever you work, wherever you are, um, you know, just, um, just thank, thanks very much for, for coming. Thank you. And thank you, Johnny, for working with us so closely uh, and so amazingly uh, trying to help us understand your story, letting us into your world and your family um, and and your artwork, really. It's been really brilliant to be able to work with you this closely. And I'm very much looking forward to taking this forward with both you and the rest of the artists we're working with. And in fact, before I close, I want to say that the um, the next part of this series is a workshop by Jan Sargent, which we are working on at the moment. We haven't got the exact date. It's going to be at some point, third week of January, we think, and we will be posting this Jan and doing once we decide and, and sort of get all our, our schedules together. But it will be more of a workshop um, with patients and carers attending, but more of that on our website. And we're very happy if you are interested, do send an email on uh, the Oxwip website uh, and we, we will be keeping you posted. So thank you all of you for attending today. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to Kevin. Thank you to Lily, to John, Jacqueline, and of course, a huge thank you to Johnny for the tremendous effort to make this um, a reality today. And I hope that everybody who was here today enjoyed uh, what we're doing. If you have any questions or any ideas or want to join us, by all means, get in touch with us. Happy Christmas, everybody.